So you studied a long time ago um, in England mm -hmm. and it would be great if you could share um, what you actually learned there and how it informed what you did later on. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I was one of the fortunate people who were, um, you know, at that age to be able to go to, um, to England at the time because there were not very many who went from Pakistan. And um, I uh, finally graduated from Oxford School of Architecture, which is, uh, of course, now part of uh, Oxford Brookes University. And certainly the training was very good and very rigorous, and I think it taught a lot of things that were important um, uh, for practicing architects. Um, but of course, the whole curriculum was uh, um, designed for producing certain kind of architecture as well. And uh, uh, where it suited very well the situation in Europe or in the West, um, I felt after I went back to Pakistan that I needed to perhaps unlearn myself of many of the um, teachings that uh, had been imparted because of the conditions that were so different in, in my country. Uh, the poverty levels were high, the um, kind of architecture that there was was very different from Europe. Um, the, the, what we call medieval towns, they had their special value, which I'd never actually known before, I have to say, because, you know, coming from a privileged background where you're totally insulated, we'd never gone around old towns or the cities, and my father particularly, because he'd been a, a, a government servant, a, a, a bureaucrat under the British, so he acted like the British so that natives were not really, we were not in touch with the natives if you like or something like that. It was pretty ridiculous when you think about it because Pakistan had become free but you know the mindset still remained. So for me to go back, uh, I'd got married by the time my husband had been at Oxford. Um, he's, um, he'd read modern greats there and we both came back and we decided to go and see old towns and move around with the people which had not, we'd not been able to do before. So um, I realized that I had, to be, I had to really start thinking in a different manner uh, than what I had been taught, because the situation was very different, the context was very different. Uh, but I think the skills that I learned uh, were very good and came in very handy in the work that I did. Uh, first of all, I think the importance of architecture as a vocation and not like a an activity or a business was important. That was really, um, I think, taught very, very, um, very diligently that you had to really be doing things which will be beneficial for others as well. It was not only for yourself. At the same time, we were also taught that you should have a very, uh, have an inflated ego. I mean, we were, we were encouraged to have an inflated ego. And um, uh, we were also taught that uh, as a creator of wonderful buildings, uh, you were literally next to God, you know, and so that one came back with thinking that, you know, one just knew everything and, you know, one could do everything and that sort of thing. So uh, that was good for a time, but I think uh, perhaps uh, the world having changed, and especially in my world where I went back to was quite different. So I had to, you know, put away some of the teachings that had been taught. In a way, your own trajectory in architecture has changed quite, maybe looked at from the outside, quite dramatically or um, in, in very distinct ways. And, and uh, you were part of the history of uh, modernism and now you're part of the history of CO2-free architecture or you are writing its history. And we would like to ask you to, to talk about that. I mean, the, the changes that your own architectural trajectory has um, undergone and, and how you see your previous work and how you see your work today in yeah. relation to both your right. previous work but also the future of architecture. Right. Um, of course, I think um, over time, because I started my practice in 1964 and I retired in 2000, there's a long time that I was able to uh, design the way that I wanted to. I could, um, my ego was insufferable. And, uh, <laughs> and so um, I, I was able to um, do some of the largest, uh, or design some of the largest uh, corporate structures. 
Uh, so I really built for the 1% in a big way. Uh, but at the same time, because of my other interest, I was able to work in low-income housing, uh, like the Anguri Bach scheme, which was uh, done for the poor, but also understanding that anything that is built in that manner never goes to the target communities. It finally is given out as political favors to others. But it, I was modeling it on the old towns where the narrows, were, the streets were narrow, and uh, there were, you know, semi-private, semi-public spaces where communities could interact with each other, and so on. So I did try to bring in those aspects. Or another project was lines area development, which was I think over 200 acres of land and something like I don't know thousands of I can't remember now, but thousands of people who are, were going to be displaced, but. Uh, through design, uh, which I call low-rise, high-density, we were able to accommodate them within that area and also raise money for uh, making it totally uh, you know, self-sustainable. So I'd been working on these things, but by and large, my most work was for the corporate sector and for the elite 1%. Um, and that was enjoyable, but I don't think now looking back that that was the best thing to do for, for as an architect because that only served very few people. And I retired actually because my husband had retired and he had begun to write books and I thought I should be doing the same thing. So that's why I did retire. But then uh, I was um, taken up by UNESCO as their national advisor at the Lahore Fort, a well heritage site. And I was there for about three years. And then an um, earthquake happened in Pakistan, 2005. And that changed everything for me radically, actually. Although I had given up architecture and I knew it was a change in my life. But um, looking at the disaster where 80,000 people had died and 400,000 families had been displaced, it was something that really shook you. I mean, you know, that experience is something that you can never forget. And um, just to be able to go and help people out was uh, amazingly rewarding. And the funny thing is that I had really literally no funding. I had given up, as you know, as I said earlier, my architectural practice. I had hardly any uh, people working for me. Um, Lahore Fort was a UNESCO project, so I was working with the government uh, um, uh, officials there. And uh, suddenly the earthquake happened and I decided to go up there. But what is amazing about humanitarian work is that you may think that you have nobody with you, but soon everybody is there to help you. And it's just, just an incredible experience. I got volunteers from all over the world, basically, who came and help out, to help out in the area. From Pakistan, a lot of people came. And so it was all voluntary work. And um, that somehow, uh, is, you have to taste it to really know what it means for yourself. And, um, uh, and how it changes your life. Working for others was not something I had done before because it always working for myself or my ego. And here it was, there was nothing in it for me and I was working for others. And that was so rewarding that I don't think that I can even describe it how good it felt. So uh, that, of course, has changed my life entirely. I should have come back after three months from the earthquake area. I was there for something like three or four years. And by that time, another disaster happened and we went to work there and another and another. So every year, literally, from about 2010, we've had either earthquakes or floods in Pakistan. But what has it done is that it has allowed me, first of all, to understand communities across Pakistan, because we've worked in the north and worked in the south. And what it's done is for me to understand what is needed for the people to be able to have safe structures and how they can build them themselves. So it's all a participatory approach that has happened. And uh, going back to your question, um, I used a lot of uh, reinforced concrete, I've used a lot of steel, I've used a lot of reflected glass, and um, uh, you know, I enjoyed designing those buildings. But now when I look back, obviously, the carbon footprint was very, very high. And um, uh, I don't know if today I was still practicing, would I do that? I'm not so sure, actually. But at that time, and I'm now talking of the 1980s, 
uh, these were not the issues that anybody thought about or architects were not really supposed to be thinking about that. And uh, as far as I was concerned, I was trained to become a star architect and that's what I was and I enjoyed it. But uh, looking at today's world where uh, global warming is such a big issue, where it's threatening everybody's life and their lifestyles, I think architects have to become now very different in the way that they think. And talking about your practice nowadays, the barefoot ecosystem, uh, there are so many, I think so, such a lot of people try to do this, like in, in German we say to give help for helping yourself if you're talking about uh, international aid. So that's always the slogan they have. We are not giving charity, we are trying to help people to help themselves, but at the end it mostly ends up in charity. Yeah. Uh, you know that much better, I guess. So how did you really manage to avoid that trap? This kind of aid charity trap because it seems so plausible, but it's mm. so difficult. Well, you know, initially, of course, one followed the same path internationally. That was the thing to do, and I'd had no experience in working for humanitarian causes, and uh, so it was something very new. And um, I, I have to say that I did work with uh, several um, organizations, international organizations. But then I also found that although a lot of money was spent, but it never really was sustainable. Nothing would move after the money was gone and the project had ended. And that looked as if there was a failure uh, where we were not able to do much for the people. Also, um, uh, as you rightly point out, um, finally it all becomes charity. And charity is very demeaning and it robs one of entire your self-respect. Because you tend to become a beggar. And, um, uh, and you don't feel any qualms about it. You feel it's your right to just accept everything to be given out for free to you. But that also means that people are not empowered, that people, feel, um, or people do not feel empowered enough to do anything themselves. So thinking that about, um, I would say about three or four years ago, I decided uh, we will not really work with international organizations because of the constraints that they have and the international silo system, you know, where there are clusters. So one UN organization, for instance, UN Habitat will only build shelters, UNICEF will only give water, uh, FAO will only have plants and so on and so forth. And so nobody ever got all their needs fulfilled. And that didn't seem to be the right way to go. So I decided that uh, we will be following a holistic model, which will mean that at least the, what I call the right space development, that must take place, which is that everybody should be able to have a safe shelter. They must have sanitation, which for me is an echo toilet. They must have water, which again for us means uh, a raised hand pump so that if flood waters comes in, come in, the hand pump is not destroyed or uh, doesn't become inaccessible. And, um, and, and, and cooking facility, which is not really mentioned either in the uh, sustainable development goals or any other goals that I know of, uh, but so important for women and for uh, families to have hygienic food. So. Uh, we have designed this Pakistan chula that especially is for the need for fulfill the needs of women and of, of the family. And that's all in earth. But over time then I also understood that if I want to build for the poor, then I have to use materials that are local and that are sustainable. And the funny thing is that when you work for the poor, you're trying to save their lives, but also you're trying to save the planet because somehow there is a kind of a nexus in this. The materials that you use are uh, local materials that are easily available, that have been used for centuries by those people. Uh, the only problem has been that over time, the skills have either been lost or uh, the importance of certain ways of building is no longer there. But if you look at these forms, or you look at the techniques, there are many that you can take up and with slight bit of intervention, and this is what architects can do, is to make them safer and much better in many ways. 
but the local character should not be lost. The, the, the actual uh, vernacular, vernacular aspect of it should not be lost because that's what makes the people proud and, and uh, you know, wanting to live in those, those particular kind of uh, developments. So it's been a long time, ever since 2005, uh, every time uh, we worked in a certain area, I think I've, I've designed for every situation wherever we've gone. And so I have developed, I think, in my own thinking as to how I should deal with issues. And uh, since we work a lot with women, I believe very strongly that women have to be brought forward. A lot of it is because they are normally downtrodden, normally in our society, particularly um, in rural areas, uh, women are not allowed um, many freedoms. And uh, it's very important to somehow uh, make them, you know, make them really proud of who they are. And so whatever I design, for instance, the Pakistan Chula, which is only an earthen platform. But I think every bit that we do, it should uh, be about dignity of people and especially dignity of women. So the chula elevates the woman from sitting on the floor and cooking in an open flame kind of a stove, which means that, um, you know, she inhales all the smoke. That means that uh, it, it, her eyes get affected and all kinds of diseases happen. And a lot of filth is around you because you're on the floor. Uh, and a lot of kids actually get burnt as well with the open flame. And the moment you elevate them even on an earthen platform, it provides them with dignity and self-respect and clean food being given out. And she sits, rather than crouching on the floor, she'd be sitting on the earthen platform as if she's sitting on a throne. So her back is erect. So the whole demeanor changes. So that's what I want, that every little bit that we do, it's not just a piece of architecture or you know building or um, uh, maybe it's safe and so on, but also that it should provide, it should be really catering to the well-being and dignity of these populations. So it should be go, it should go beyond just the structure itself. So in practical terms, you have worked in the Sindh region for many years now, um, and I think there are now forty thousand houses that came to being. Are you actually in the region all the time? Do you have like a mobile office or is it more that you educate others um, that then do the work of working um, in the field or working lo yeah. locally? Yeah, it's a, now I have a team. It's a very small team actually, without that many people. Uh, but the whole process is to train others who will go and help others to build. So now, by now, we've trained actually a massive number of artisans, particularly, who now know the skills and can go out to build. But my special, um, I mean, the, the, the way that I'm looking at things now and the way I want to go forward uh, is that this stratagem that I adopt is called social, barefoot social architecture. This is to, like, uh, you know, social engineering, which we change the mindset from being dependent to becoming self-reliant. So the whole purpose is to make people empowered enough to do that. And um, uh, it, it really relies on what I call the barefoot ecosystem, because it exists, because there, you know, there's something like almost 50% people below, living below the poverty line in Pakistan, which is a huge number. Uh, so the, they exist, but they are not really taken seriously. Because, you know, uh, People like myself and others who are educated, we feel that only we know how to deal with things and the poor have nothing, so they know nothing, which is totally untrue. So you have to see how you can build up their own capabilities, which already exist, but they have to be, you know, somehow brought up. And um, uh, so in this barefoot ecosystem, there's also the barefoot economy, uh, which is the transaction of goods, which is between themselves, basically, and could be for their own um, getting a better quality of life for them. Uh, there's also the barefoot market, uh, which means that if you are uh, making products which are useful to the poor, then uh, these will sell very well. And we have seen that they are actually selling very well. And then there are barefoot enterprises, which are really social enterprises. But I think what we have to see is the difference between any kind of enterprise which is in the market economy, which is really to benefit your own self or your, your uh, 
investors, and there's this the social enterprise, which is really for the well-being of others. So what we have to see is that in the in this barefoot ecosystem, the enterprises that are developed are there. Of course, it helps you, but it is also for the good of others. Only then it makes sense. So if you can make money out of teaching somebody else how to build better, well, that's fine. That is how it should be. So uh, that seems to be working. And I think that this is the way we have to now go if we want to spread the thing. Because another important factor is that the international aid system is very expensive. So if Anktar says that there's a shortfall of $2 trillion every year for developing countries to reach the SDGs by 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, well, that will never happen because $4 trillion will never be raised. Even $2 trillion, it seems, is difficult to raise. So then where are we then? What happens to the developing countries? Do they just stay behind? Do we not bother about the SDGs? Or do we work out a system which is economical, which resonates with people themselves, which can give them a comfortable shelter, which can give them sanitation, other uh, elements of SDGs at a very low cost? and empowers them to do better. Of course, there's education and health, which I'm not even touching on, but those are all issues that have to be taken care of. But what is interesting is once you are able to reach out to the people and they begin to understand the value of education, so more children will go to school because now they have a safe shelter, they can sit comfortable, comfortably, they don't have filth around them, and then that helps them to aim for better life. And that's what we need to do. Uh, well-being of the people. So I think that uh, this whole barefoot um, methodology uh, can work because the costs are very low. We've calculated that our costs are really not more than maximum maximum uh, quarter of it or I, I think it's more like 15% of the normal cost. So then I think two trillion dollars will be more than enough and that's what I'm aiming at. As long as we continue to build safe structures, that's the important thing. We don't want the disaster should come in and again something should collapse and they lose everything. Because as you know, every time a disaster happens, the vulnerability increases. Because the family would have lost what they had and they haven't had time to build up anything and so that's it. But if we can just make sure that everybody's safe and their goods are safe and they themselves are safe, then I think next time they can rise a little bit better. So that's where our effort is right now. And uh, uh, with this number of people, I've, I'll be showing the slides, uh, something like 0.84 million people have already benefited. But of course, there are millions that we need to get to. So it's again still a drop in the ocean. This question of um, safe and healthy structures, like now talking about build, built structures, I would like to uh, connect that to uh, the term care that uh, Elke and myself uh, are using uh, within yes. the project Critical Care, yes. where we are referring uh, to care theory, meaning uh, you, you start in the, in the midst of things, mm. so you start with what, what is already given, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think what's so um, inter uh, one of the many things which is so interesting about your practice is that you start with the given, like what's mm -hmm. there locally, what are traditional uh, techniques, but it's of course about transformation, it's about improving. So starting mm -hmm. in the midst of thing doesn't mean that one has to become nostalgic and mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. they have to do it the same way as it was done a thousand mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's both. It's, mm -hmm. it's like it's contemporary, but it's, mm -hmm. it, it's highly contextual. Or how do you refer to the care uh, perspective that we tried to... Yeah, I think uh, perhaps what you're saying, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, you have no control over situations. And uh, uh, you, you have to work with what you have available, obviously. Um, my, my own dictum is uh, low cost, zero carbon, zero waste. That's what I believe in. And that's what we are working with. Uh, because for all of us now, it becomes very important that we do not fritter away the Earth's resources. And um, uh, since our populations are so large in developing countries, I think there's an added responsibility on us to see that, um, first of all, our own 
populations live in, uh, as I keep on saying, in dignity and we have their well-being at heart. And it doesn't mean a lot of money, it means in the, the, that at least the unmet needs are, are fulfilled. That's all that is needed really. And uh, as far as the uh, other countries are concerned of the first world, of course the responsibility lies there because there's a lot of waste there and there could be a lot that could be done. And there, of course, you could be talking of maybe hybrid architecture where you may have a, um, you know, a high carbon envelope like the basic structure of concrete or steel, but inside you could have low carbon finishes or low carbon partitions or something. So I think all of us can contribute uh, the level of care that you're talking of in wherever we are. It may be that somewhere we can do a bit better than the other, but everybody's got to start trying to do that. And that's why I think your own exhibition and your book is so important, they're both so important, that you are focusing on the aspects that are not, not necessary for the planet. Because uh, after all, that is what we all have to care for. So, uh, so I think um, it's wonderful that you've been able to do this hard work and put it all in and, you know, taking the whole thing forward. I think it's, it's amazing, actually. Even though that sounds like a closing word, um, yes. I, I wanted to um, to come back to the question of, of materials. I mean, we're working a lot with bamboo, but also other materials. And it would be great if you could elaborate on the choice of materials and also on the, the, the craft of architecture that, that you're training mostly women, but also men in. Mm -hmm. And that, from what I understood, they are not only building homes, but they are also building um, other products that they then sell. In what you were saying, the mm. poor selling to the poor. So, so in a way, this yeah. economy amongst the poor that is not based on neither charity mm. um, nor exploitation. Yes, yes. Well, firstly, of course, what is, uh, I think, has to be uh, understood that Pakistan has a very rich cultural history, that we have an absolutely diverse heritage going back to Bronze Age, and, you know, I, I'll be mentioning that in my talk today, and um, uh, Hindu, um, uh, you know, uh, Buddhist, and um, all kinds of different architecture, and, of course, the Mughals, and so on, and then uh, the British period. So we have really many of those. But the strongest is our vernacular heritage, which comes from people from within them. And women particularly are custodians of this, what we call intangible heritage. So there's just so much pattern everywhere. There's so much design everywhere that all through their lives, they have been making things either with their um, needles, with embroidery or with uh, patchwork or with uh, uh, printing things, you know, hand block printing. And also with our glaze style that is called Kashi that you saw in that beautiful, um, you know, uh, restaurant that we were there. And, uh, and all that exists within them. So what is normally, and even I was taken aback, how they use their creativity, which has come through to us from our Pakistan Chula that got the award from World Habitat just this last year. So the materials that I felt were abundant were really clay, the earth that is there in almost all regions of Pakistan. But I'm not averse to using stone also wherever it's, it's available. So we, we use local material, but earth is the predominant one. And then, of course, there is a, a bamboo that is used, but very poorly. I mean, a lot of construction uh, for poor is done by bamboo, using bamboo, but they don't know how to really put it together. So it's never safe. And uh, uh, that's something that now we use. And then lime is something that's been forgotten. And I'll be talking about my lime guru, which is uh, Vitruvius, because he talks about how lime should be slaked and so on. So lime is an amazing material that has always been used for centuries. And uh, we know that it's very effective. But most of us who've been trained uh, in architectural schools have never heard or never used lime before, because cement is the one that everybody wants to use. And we know how uh, highly energy consumptive uh, cement is, uh, as is steel in fact. So lime has been used a lot in conservation, that's why I started to use it. But uh, lime has hardly ever been used for humanitarian work and not with mud so much. I believe in Central America, maybe in some of the conservation work, lime and mud is used, but not, uh, not for humanitarian work. 
So I just decided to use it and uh, it's just been giving us absolutely rich dividends because all the structures are now safe from water because lime is, you know, it has this cohesive quality. And uh, we teach our women how to use lime and that's how they make their plasters. And so things that used to crumble before are now no longer, uh, you know, getting damaged. So this is where you need actually um, architects with sensitivity and good design sense. Because where you have problems of either cost or deficient in something or, uh, uh, you know, there's a need uh, to fulfill, then I think you need good designers to come and work there. So if you can get good designers to devote their time to these mundane things like the poor and what they need, I think will make a great headway. And that's what I think we should be doing as much as possible. Now there is a fallacy, I think, that there is no money for an architect if they work in humanitarian field. I mean, for me it's different. I do pro bono work because at this time in my life and because I am heading an institution, I do pro bono. I mean, this is all for me, this is all pro bono. But the, for young people who want to get into this field, there's such a huge amount of money that's invested into disaster areas and post-disaster development. Why is it that architects particularly are not there? I, cannot, I cannot understand. Because the money is there and the same money would be, so, would be used so much better if things were designed properly. And obviously somebody is earning money out of this and why is it not the designers who should be there in the field? So I think we can make a very strong case and particularly I think to the aid giving agencies who actually do not employ architects. A lot of the designs are so bad I cannot even begin to tell you. You know, and they are just like, you know, it's awful actually. So another thing is this, that, you know, why are we treating the poor? Because we treat them like they're victims and they'll take anything, uh, whatever you give them, uh, you give them the worst possible things. And then you feel very pleased that you've helped them. But, you know, uh, I think it's counterproductive. So we need to work out, first of all, that we should really treat them with, again, with a lot of respect because those are the clients. And anybody who's working for them is there because, you know, they're getting some benefit out of it. So they should be, you know, treated with huge amount of respect. And as I keep on saying, we should give them the same kind of, uh, the same kind of respect as we give to our corporate clients and, and do a really a good job because that's what they deserve. So even if they are not paying your fee or their fee, uh, you're getting the money from somewhere, but finally they are the clients. So I think uh, for architects, I think it's important to understand that. And I would really like more architects in the field. I'm missing them actually. Because if they were there, I think we'd be able to do a far better job because you, you know, then you get good design for things. So, and there's a, the work that I do now with these materials, of course, I don't call it my architecture anymore because I think it's a collaborative work. It's, uh, it comes out because what, you know, the users themselves contribute to it. And my job, I feel, is to create a kind of canvas, if you like, and then they show their own creativity in it so that every one of these items becomes personalized and they can take great, great pride. That shows that they have great pride in it. That's how they, they beautify it. And it also shows the creative reserves that they do have, which we do not normally acknowledge, but we should. Uh, because obviously this is something that's been there for generations and now they're able to express it. But we also must know that they would not have been able to do it unless it was the materials that are being used, which is earth. Because they're used to earth and so they can make their designs on earth. They would never do the same thing on concrete block or, or burn brick. So the materials that you choose or use are extremely important if you want to work with poor people or people who are disadvantaged. Uh, so these are the three materials that I use. I do use thatch as well and I said sometimes stone, but apart from that, no cement at all. Whether it's, a, it's our lime concrete in the base or whether it's a, a lime concrete uh, ring beam, which has it's bamboo reinforced. So it's always uh, either earth, lime and bamboo and that's it. On the level of aid giving agencies, um, so you were pointing out that there are rarely any architects involved and that the kind of designs that are being realized are poor. Um, so, so there's very poor in the sense of bad design 
for poor people. And insensitive, actually, insensitive also. Insensitive. Yeah. And uh, so I was just wondering who will be those who intervene into aid giving agencies in order for them to understand that there is a need to collaborate with architects or to employ them. So, so whom do you see on the level of this international um, yeah. world to do mm. that kind of work? Yeah, of course, first there's the UN system, which has, uh, of course, uh, goes a long way in doing these things. But, you know, they are huge, like the um, uh, European Union, for instance, provides a lot of aid. So they are the ones who should be looking at it. The DFID, which is the British, uh, uh, you know, international development or Scottish international development, these should be looking at these issues because finally it's the taxpayers' money, your taxpayers' money that's being invested into aid. And why is it not being done in a manner that it can have the maximum benefit? I mean, I don't understand this. So they have to rethink the way that they work, which I don't think they're doing somehow. And I think you guys should be now getting after them and say, well, fix it. And do you think that architecture Architecture education is ready for that. As you said about mm. your own uh, education, you were yeah. trained to be a star architect. And I think many schools are still working. Yes, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. And so the question is, if there are more architects uh, in uh, humanitarian aid, uh, will they really do a good job? Yeah. The majority of them. Yeah. Well, of course, um, uh, yeah, this is a big question because um, but I don't know, I, you must have read Thomas Piketty and, and Anderson and so on who are talking of, you know, the, the distribution of wealth and how, you know, it's being kind of collected into some hands and so on. So I think people are now aware that inequalities exist everywhere and that we have to do something about it. And uh, of course, um, architects, uh, since they are trained to work for that 1% or maybe 2% in your country, uh, this attitude has to change and it must come from the, from the universities. Um, uh, but you see, the, the misleading thought is that uh, unless uh, you can't call yourself an architect unless you have the most inflated ego and that you can you design the most fabulous building. But sometimes, um, I mean, good design can be translated into many different ways. It doesn't have to be the impressive kind of object art, if you like. So uh, I think this is something that uh, universities must start looking at now. Uh, in my country also nobody seems to listen to this, They all, everybody wants to become a star architect. But, uh, but I think um, the more we talk about these things, uh, the more we can discuss it, uh, and especially in the light of climate change, especially now. Because we know what's happening, we know the disasters that are occurring all over the world, it's not only one place, well why is it happening? And architects and engineers and people who are involved in building have a lot to pay for it actually. Because uh, I'll show, I, in my slides I do show how much of uh, energy uh, is used in various materials. And I think this should be mandatory in every university to look at materials and say, okay, which are the ones that should be now used uh, which will help. Now I, I understand because I've been a contemporary architect, I know there are some materials that you, know, you just will have to use in urban areas. But as I said, why aren't we looking at hybrid kind of architecture? Why aren't we saying, okay, we can't do zero carbon, but we can do low carbon. And that's all right also, because we are at least going in that direction. But if you don't even think about it and we carry on as if, uh, you know, there was no tomorrow, as they say, well, things are going to become much worse because disasters are hitting us from all sides now. So, um, so this would be my plea, basically. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. So, this was really a lot of great insights, I think. So, well, I hope you've changed the world. It's too late for me now, but you guys are still young, so you can do it. So. <laughs>